Is that good? Yeah. Turn this way, say so you know. yes. <laughs> so, um, Charles Dickens wrote a book called David Copperfield. Anybody familiar with that long book? There's a story in there about little Emily who has a runoff with a scandalous man. He has seduced her. Uh, without really any concern for her future, he has no intention of actually marrying her, uh, no concern for the wider community. And um, it's just little Emily running off with this scandalous man is highly distressing to the uncle who loves her, who has adopted her um, as a young child. <coughs> when she was very young, the uncle came and adopted her, and now he is incredibly incredibly distressed by this turn of events, by this distress and failure and sin and recri recrimination that kind of echo and reverberate through the whole family and community. And so the uncle vows that he is going to go and get her, to rescue her. He says, I cannot forget. I'm going to seek her far and wide. And if any harm comes to me, my last words are this. My unchanged love is with my darling child, and I forgive her. <coughs> so even if it comes with his own loss of faith, his own financial ruin, even his own death, because he is going to be going into these dangerous uh, situations, even if it comes to all of that, he is determined to go and search for her and has already, before even finding her, has already forgiven her. Our actions, the young man seducing this uh, young woman with no concern for her or her community, and her weakness in falling for him. All of this reverberates, right, through community. And of course, this uncle, we can easily see, is a Christ figure, right? Christ coming, God sending Christ to come and get his beloved children. But as any of us know who have suffered grievous harm, either through our own actions or through the actions of others, forgiveness itself doesn't really <coughs> fix it. Forgiveness, of course, is <coughs> critical. It's critical not only to our own health, but it's critical in that it opens a space. It opens a place and a space for creativity and forward <coughs> for going on. But it doesn't repair <coughs> what has been damaged. So if you break a glass, in other words, it shatters on the floor. And even if you pick up all those pieces and make them into a nice stained glass window and the light shines through, the glass is still broken. <coughs> so I know it's odd in Advent to go to the cross, but that's what I'm going to do right now. In the cross, God is doing something more than just forgiving us. In the cross and in Advent, in this looking towards the coming again of Christ, God is doing something more than just seeking us out and forgiving us, as happens with, <coughs> with the uncle. God is actually rectifying, doing something to put things back together again in a way that we can never do. Have you ever worked at forgiveness? I mean, really worked at it? Because something really bad has happened? You maybe have had to forgive yourself or forgive somebody else. And you know that, okay, you've gotten to that place of forgiving, but the scars remain, and the memory pop continues to pop up, and you have to kind of go through that process again. That's important work, and it's at the heart of our faith. But also at the heart of our faith is God's promise and God's power and God's purpose to put things back together again. A new heaven and a new earth. And that, my friend,
friends is what Advent really points us to. So Advent, you see, is not really about purple stoles. And it's not really about Advent wreaths or Advent calendars or Christmas trees or mangers. All of that is really lovely. And I have, I have a decorated, big decorated Christmas tree in my home. And I'm very proud of it. Because I don't always do that. And I play Christmas carols in my home because I love them and they make me feel really, really good. And I have asked Eric that, you know, let's bring in some Christmas carols before Christmas Eve. Because we want to sing them. God knows we need things. We need brightness and cheer and lovely things to to warm our days and brighten them. Give us what the Dutch called called something like huga. Anybody know huga? Huga. It's a feeling the Dutch bring it to us. It's a feeling of cozy contentment and well-being through enjoying the simple things in life, like you know, drinking a hot cup of cocoa when it's really cold outside, or reading cuddling up with a really good book. And the day is stretched out before you because it's raining and you can't do anything in your yard. That's Huga. Bringing a green tree into your house and lighting it with, stringing it with lights. And so in the darkening days of the year, it's natural and it's good and it's lovely and wonderful for us to string lights and celebrate the Feast of St. Nicholas, which we are doing today. <laughs> But now it's preaching time. And I'm telling you that the good news of Advent is not really about any of these cozy things, but it is actually about the coming day of judgment. (coughs) Of God's promise and God's commitment to return among us and to put right all the things that are wrong. To rectify the situation we find ourselves in. Advent is about God's promise to return in Christ to create a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm going to confess to you that I don't put a whole lot of stock in this coming again part. You know? I don't give that much emphasis in my Christian walk. I don't know about you, but I'm not one of those Christ is coming anytime soon kind of people. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and the Philippians, they expected Jesus to return (coughs) at any minute. And as time went on, you know, they modified their expectations and and as time has gone on for a couple of thousand years, we've really and truly modified our expectations. Until a lot of Advent-type preaching about Christ coming again refers to this truth that Christ is always coming to us. Christ is always come to, coming to us in word and in sacraments, in the Eucharistic bread and in the baptismal waters and in acts of love and service to our neighbors. Christ is always coming again. But this coming again, this, you know, coming again always in in our acts of love and service and repentance and word and sacrament, it kind of seems like a little bit like a consolation prize, right? Is this really all we can hope for? Where is the justice that rolls down like mighty waters? Where is the equaling out of massive inequality? You know, the leveling of the hills and the raising of the valleys? Where is the rectification for victims of torture and lynchings and false imprisonments? Where is, where, where, where in the wilderness that we live in is the hope of the nation, not just for an uneasy peace, you know, that keeps us all relatively safe, but for the wholeness of God's shalom, that is promised from the beginning of the Bible straight through to the end. Where is this wholeness, this shalom that is promised? And it's not promised just for humankind, but for all flesh. This assurance and confidence that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Where is this great day of judgment? (coughs) All that is wrong will be set right. 
Because, you know, whether we are Christian or not, we all long for God's shalom. In the eighth chapter of Romans, Paul says, for the creation, the whole creation, the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, that the creation itself will be set free from bondage to decay and will attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. All creation groans for things to be set right, for wrongs to be righted, and for redemption and healing. And it is God's promise and God's commitment that that groaning, that longing, will be completely fulfilled. And it will happen in God's time. In the fullness of time. That great day of judgment will come upon us like a thief in the night, Jesus says. And about that day, Malachi, that Old Testament prophet Malachi says, who can stand? Who can stand when the refining fire arrives because he is coming? I am coming, says the Lord of hosts. And not one of us can stand. Not one of us, whether we're standing in the pulpit or counting cards in the casino. Whether we have honestly paid all our taxes or have stored our profits offshore and live way beyond our means. Whether we are good in the eyes of all or bad in the eyes of many, we shall all, every one of us, stand before that great judgment seat and have those infinite eyes of justice and mercy and compassion look deep within us until all that is not pure is burned away and we are truly set free and truly remade into his new creation. That is good news, isn't it? I know it sounds scary. I know it sounds a little bit like, you know, it could, it could sound like that parent that believes in corporal punishment or, you know, that teacher that couldn't control the classroom any other way but just punishing in weird, blaming, shaming kind of ways. But this is the God of Jesus Christ. This is the God who is infinite mercy and infinitely about healing and infinitely about wholeness and right, and good, and shalom, and peace. And God is able, God's promise, and power, and purpose is able to bring that about for us in our world in the fullness of time. And so we pray um, that great, that great first collective advent a prayer of repentance to make us ready for that great day. Please pray with me. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now, now, in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility. That in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, that when he shall come again in his glorious majesty, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.